Wells, a senior scholar here at the Wilson Center, filling in for Ali S. Fandiari. I'd like to welcome you to a session on the Iranian presidential elections. What do they tell us? Obviously, there's been a lot of evidence, uh, bits of evidence spread about, a lot of interpretations, almost more interpretations than there are bits of evidence. And they, frankly, are all over the map. But we hope that our four speakers today will give us some patterns and some clarification in what we should make of this important election in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Among the things that I hope they will address are, is the election really as significant as the media in the United States and in Europe has made it out to be? Has the opposition to the regime been broadly enough based that it can survive repression, that it can continue to work even behind the scenes? Is compromise possible or desired by the leadership? And ultimately, if, as the Guardian Council's validation of the election yesterday seems to indicate, Ahmadinejad continues in office, what are the implications both for the stability of the regime and for foreign policy? You've had available to you the biographies of the speakers. I won't go into those in any detail. Let me first say that our initial speaker is Robin Wright, longtime international journalist with the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, now a public policy scholar here at the center and uh, one of our most valued experts on the Middle East. Robin? Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who were here when we did our pre-election uh, presentation, I ended my uh, PowerPoint with this slide, which turned out to be far more prescient than I knew. I didn't realize exactly how explosive this election uh, potentially was going to be. So where are we? Uh, the first week was clearly a political showdown over a disputed election that declared Ahmadinejad the winner. The second week was about a physical confrontation as the protests continued and as the state began to clamp down. And most importantly, as the flashpoint shifted uh, from the election to the powers of the supreme leader. Now we're into the third week and we've begun what I call the sorting out process. Uh, both politically and on the streets. I have 10 bottom lines uh, to offer and three guidelines in judging what will happen next. My first bottom line is that a regime that came to power through a brutal revolution in a country suspected of developing a nuclear weapons program faced its biggest challenge in 30 years from peaceful civil disobedience. It was a stunning precedent for both Iran and the entire Middle East. Iran's uprising needs to be understood, I think, however, in a global context. In other words, the past uh, 20 days fits into a much broader historic pattern. Uh, the largest public demonstration since 1979 forced the regime to face the same ideals that have swept across uh, five continents over the last 25 years and forced regimes to take into account the supremacy of popular will, accountability, accountability transparency, and issues of justice. Um, the outside world has focused on how tech-savvy Iranians use Twitter and Facebook uh, in their protests. But the same technology also has educated Iranians over many years about what's happening elsewhere in the world. And many Iranians very much want to be part of the 21st century. Uh, in many ways, some kind of challenge was also inevitable uh, given Iran's modern history. For a century, Iranians have been uh, trailblazers, political trailblazers, both uh, in the region and in the wider 57 nations of the Islamic bloc. 
their quest for empowerment has played out in four different phases. Um, from 1905 to 1911, there was a constitutional rebellion, the very first of its kind in Asia, uh, a powerful coalition of intelligentsia, bazaar merchants, and clergy forced the Qajar dynasty uh, to accept a constitution and Iran's first parliament. In 1953, the democratically elected National Front, coalition of four parties led by Prime Minister Moksadeh, pushed constitutional democracy and forced the last Pahlavi Shah to flee to Rome. Um, and in 1979, yet another coalition of bazaaris, clergy, and intellectuals mobilized on the streets to end dynastic rule. So the energy that's been unleashed this month in both peaceful demonstrations and in angry protests from the Caspian coast down to southern Shiraz uh, is the natural sequel in this string of events. Each of the first three phases left indelible imprints that in some way opened up Iranian politics and define what followed. And I think this fourth phase will too. Today's opposition movement is very distinct from the 1999 student protests, which failed because it involved only one sector of society and it was a body without either a head or a strategy. In contrast, when you look at the the variety of people who turned out on the streets. The coalition today, and the key word here again is another coalition, is the most powerful since the revolution. Uh, it includes people of all ages and all classes, youth that make up the demographic majority in Iran, feisty women, again trailblazers in the wider Islamic world. It also included sanction-strapped businessmen, two former presidents and a prime minister, as well as taxi drivers, civil servants, members of the national soccer team, and senior citizens. Uh, one of the most interesting things is the role of the clergy in all of this. Uh, several have spoken out adding legitimacy to the challenge. Uh, Ayatollah Ali Montazuri, who uh, would have been prime minister if he'd not decided to speak out just months before Imam Khomeini died in criticizing the regime, um, has issued a virtual fatwa uh, dismissing the election results and urging Iranians to reclaim their dues in calm protests. He also warned security forces not to follow orders that might later lead them to be condemned by God. Um, today, he wrote, censorship and cutting communi communication lines cannot hide the truth. Uh, another outspoken cleric is Grand Ayatollah uh, Musavi Ardabili, who told the Guardian Council that we must hear the objections that the protesters have to the elections. We must let the protesters, the people, speak. Grand Ayatollah Sanayi expressed abhorrence for those behind the violence and sympathy for the injured protesters, particularly the students. Uh, he said, what belongs to the people should be given to the people. The wishes of the people should be respected by the states. Another Grand Ayatollah, Bayad Zanjani, said the protests were both lawful and Islamic. And he too warned the security forces that it is against Islam to attack unarmed people. Most senior clerics have, in fact, um, been noticeably silent in either endorsing Ahmadinejad before the election or embracing him afterwards. And most clerics in the holy city of Qom have never um, backed an Islamic republic. And I think that we're seeing many of those objections play out in this election. Uh, now, an even more powerful coalition has backed Ahmadinejad, led by the Supreme Leader. Um, the regime has also unleashed uh, the tools of the state to support their choice, with no holes barred. The Basiji, the paramilitary uh, religious vigilantes, have become more powerful than at any time uh, since their creation after the revolution. And generally, Iran has not witnessed this scope of brutality again since the chaotic early days of the revolution. The regime's strategy is now threefold. One, to rebuff all allegations of fraud. The Council of Guardians has now given its stamp of approval. Uh, second, they're trying to um, divide and uh, conquer, to break up groups 
that dare to take to the streets into small groups to prevent anyone from taking those cell phone videos or pictures of large crowds gathering. And three, uh, to pick up the people around Aminija, I mean, about, around Musavi and the protesters. This, interestingly enough, was found by my research assistant, and it's a website where the regime is using the same technology the students um, are, putting up pictures of people who were in the demonstrations and asking people to send in any identification. And we have several as well that have right, um, uh, stamped across them, identified, they know who they are. Um, the political divide in uh, Iran is now a full-scale schism. Uh, there are people who once served in the Shah's jails together, whose mugshots still hang in the same wall in the same row in Savak's intelligence museum. Um, and I think it will be very hard to recreate that kind of unity anytime uh, in the near future. Um, the one thing we need to remember is that the protests were not a counter-revolution. The opposition is not talking about ending the Islamic Republic. They're talking instead about what it should be, how to reform it, how to refine it, uh, and how to make its officials more accountable. The core issues, in fact, um, are not new. This little word up here says republic or republicanism. Uh, the main flashpoint in this uh, confrontation really goes back to the early days of the revolution between the ideologues and the realists. The ideologues argued that the Islamic Republic should be a redeemer state, championing the cause of the world's oppressed, restoring Islamic purity uh, not only in Iran but across the 57 nations of the Islamic bloc, and creating a new Islamic body to challenge um, both East and West. Um, the realists argued that Iran should seek legitimacy by creating a capable Islamic State, by institutionalizing the revolution in a realistic, practical framework. They wanted a new political and social order, independent of the outside world, but also one that was capable of interacting with the outside world. So the bottom line issue today is really whether to give priority to the revolution or to the state, whether the Islamic Republic is first and foremost Islamic or a republic. That issue played out again in the campaign this year with Amini Najad championing the idea of the, original, of the revolutionary cleric's original vision and Musavi campaigning for the need to, to create a viable and practical state. The same issues are central to the post-election turmoil. In the latest statement, Musavi uh, tellingly warned that the large amount of cheating and vote rigging has begun to kill the idea that Islam and republicanism are compatible. So I think we need to be clear that neither the opposition leadership nor the demonstrators are rejecting the role of Islam in the state. The rallying cry today is still Allahu Akbar, God is great. Uh, they simply envision a different role for Islam and the state. Um, my final bottom line is where does that leave us? Well, the re regime has um, never been so vulnerable, and the idea of a supreme leader, an infallible political pope, uh, now faces a real challenge of legitimacy, and there is no resolution in sight. So what's next? Um, there are three factors that will determine the future. Leadership, unity, and momentum. Leadership is where the opposition is the most vulnerable. The still unanswered question um, is whether Musavi can lead this new opposition long term. The answer remains unclear. He was always an accidental leader, the product of public sentiment favoring reform. He was not the founder of it any more than um, former President Khatami was in 1997. In both elections, um, Ar Iran's savvy voters latched on to a figure who promised some degree of political, economic, and social openings and who had a prospect of winning. I think if Musavi does not demonstrate more visible leadership soon, the opposition may begin to look elsewhere. There's probably a window of opportunity uh, for him to act, and he has been increasingly less visible uh, over the past week. 
The third issue is unity, and this is where the regime is most vulnerable. Many in the government have to be worried about the long-term cost of a crackdown. Parliament has yet to get more deeply involved, um, has, sorry, has begun to get more deeply involved, both in attempts at reconciliation and in um, outspoken criticism. I'm really sorry, I had this fantastic um, video of a, sp a little speech given by a member of parliament, angry, um, getting so angry and worked up his turban keeps falling off and he has to keep pushing it back on his head and he blasts the regime and, uh, and their tactics. And it's really, it's not something I've, I've seen any place reported and I think it's, it's just in the last few days. Um, and I think that it's very striking that uh, this played out in parliament. Um, and this is also where the Speaker of Parliament, uh, Mr. Larajani, uh, himself a former presidential candidate, could emerge as an interesting uh, player. Uh, so far, he has straddled both sides. He was seen here with Amini Najad, he's the man bo bowing forward, <clears throat> uh, at the speech given by, Sir Friday sermon given by uh, the Supreme Leader. But he's also since then indicated some uh, concern about what's playing out on the streets. Um, <clears throat> the security services are another area to monitor. The Basij uh, are the regime's most loyal instrument, but it'll inter be very interesting to see what plays out among the police. This is one of many pictures of how a protester is trying to help, and there's a sequence of pictures to this so we know it's true, help this uh, policeman who, who uh, has been injured. Uh, we have lots of stories of policemen indicating to protesters that they don't uh, want to hurt them. Would they please leave so that they don't have to act? Um, but I think there are even some questions about the Revolutionary Guards, not the commanders like these men who um, have long been part of the system, but the rank and file. In 1997, the regime did um, a poll among the Revolutionary Guards to find out how they voted, and they found that 84 percent voted for the reform candidate, Mr. Katami. Uh, we have to remember that most of the Rev Guards are rank and file doing their national service, and many prefer to do uh, the Revolutionary Guards guards because they get off at 2.30 and they can um, then get a second job. Um, uh, the third issue is momentum and how the, the, this opposition movement uh, manages to sustain itself. This is my last point. Um, and I think this is going to be the trickiest part uh, because as we've already seen, the, the momentum has begun um, to slow significantly. Um, we, you know, there are the morning cycles. This is a picture of Neda, the famous Neda Sultan, who um, was the woman who, young woman who was a philosophy student who was shot on the streets and whose death, um, this is her grave, uh, marked uh, uh, the emergence of a kind of heroic figure to the revolution. But because the very tactics of mourning have been, were used originally by the re revolutionaries to propel um, the protests against the Shah, they have begun to clamp down on the, the types of engine that might create a momentum. They, for example, refuse to allow public demonstrations, public mourning, uh, as Shiites honor on the third, seventh, and fortieth day for Neda when she died. But my bottom, last bottom line is that um, I think the genie is out of the bottle. I think it's going to be impossible to put back. Um, it can be repressed for now, for a long term, but I don't think there's any way um, that uh, that th we can go back to what happened um, at the beginning of June. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Two announcements that I neglected to make at the start. Since we are being webcast and broadcast live on C-SPAN, I'd like to ask people to turn off mobile devices, cell phones, pagers, and such, because it does interfere with transmission. And I'd like to let the people in our overflow, overflow space know that we will take questions from you. There will be some paper available for you to write questions, which will be conveyed to me, and we will work you into the discussion in our second hour. The next presentation is by Farideh Farhi, an adjunct faculty member in political science at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and a scholar, former scholar here at the center a frequent visitor to our sessions and someone we always welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Do I need to turn yourself? That's good. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to pick up on uh, uh, where uh, 
Robin left um, and sort of lay out um, uh, what I think um, happened in Iran um, and essentially make an argument that uh, most of us who are sitting here um, really do not know um, where Iran is going. And uh, that's for good reason. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that um, uh, the Iranian leaders themselves probably don't know where they are going at this point. I'm going to make an argument that this is a very improvised game. It's a very improvised moment in Iranian history. And um, we are probably better off sitting down watching than uh, trying to um, analyze the situation on a minute-by-minute -minute basis to try to see which direction to go. So let me begin by saying that the crisis that has engulfed Iran um, since its election is without a doubt the most significant event in 30-year 30, history of the Islamic Republic, as far as I'm concerned. With the, the exception of the revolution itself that deeply restructured uh, the political map of the country, no other event, including, and we are talking about big events in the Islamic Republic, uh, the Iran-Iraq War, uh, the 1989 revamping of the revolution that institutionally reshaped the Islamic Republic, turning the uh, office of the leadership from a regular office of leadership into an absolute office of leadership and created the Expediency Council so because of the conflicts that existed in the country or the rise of the reformist politics. None of these ev events have been as significant as far as I can tell. And I th as far as I'm concerned, the significance of these events lie um, in the fact that throughout its life, the Islamic Republic has relied on two basic institutions to manage and moderate political competition conflicts and fundamental contradictions of the Islamic republics. And those institutions were elections and the office of the leader, Rahbari. And in this situation, both of those institutions failed, uh, and failed significantly and miserably. Um, uh, elections, amazingly, the 29th um, uh, this election was the 29th uh, that was, we just witnessed in the Islamic uh, Republic's 30-year uh, history have been a method of choice to manage mass participation, while the office of Rahbari has been the ultimate overseeing arena where intra-elite competition is regulated and ultimately negotiated, uh, not necessarily totally managed because, uh, you know, this competition goes out of control every once in a while, but that office ultimately is the body that comes in and negotiate and try to find a new balance. As I said, in this crisis, both of these institutions, irrespective of whether there was fraud or mere perception of it, and I'm in the camp that thinks that this election was not only fraudulent, it was totally cooked. I'm in the camp that thinks that the numbers were just made up, and I'm I'm happy to defend that position if there are questions, but uh, no matter what, uh, whether they were fraudulent or there is a perception of fraud, this election um, um, was mishandled uh, gigantically and ultimately failed to temper conflict and in fact ended up, both of these institutions ended up uh, heightening uh, and inciting them further. Um, in fact, I remember um, I am from Hawaii, and um, I had to stay awake until midnight, past midnight, to watch live Ayatollah Khamenei speak on Friday prayer. And um, my mouth was open. I could not believe that he would actually go on television on Friday prayer and incite the public to go into the streets the way he did. Um, uh, and that is a role that the leadership in Iran has not played um, or has not tried to play. So um, the failure of these two institutions was the direct cause of street confrontation and violence, which as far as I'm concerned is electoral politics by other means. Our, the Iranian election is still continuing uh, um, uh, and uh, will continue as far as I can tell for a while. In the process, as Robin pointed out, the damage that has been done to the legitimacy will either have to be repaired in serious ways or, have, uh, or face, these institutions will have to face serious consequences. Um, 
uh, and with, with results for the future structure of power in Iran. Either elections will become totally meaningless in Iran, for instance, or uh, the way they are conducted have to be repaired in serious ways. In short, such cosmetic and in some ways amusing efforts, for example, today by the Guardian Council to open and read the ballots of 10% of poll boxes on national television when no one knows where those boxes have been for the past two weeks and, um, you know, are really silly exercises in trying to um, repair the damage to the legitimacy of the system. But the fact that they are doing so suggests that they fully understand that something serious ha has happened, and at least they have to put a show on. So while the events in Gulf Iran must be seen as entailing certain, uh, uncertain and ultimately improvised outcome, no matter which direction events take us, there is one thing that is certain, and that is the fact that the election was seriously mishandled and mismanaged, and you could say that both sides in this very intense competition miscalculated and underestimated their opponent's power and capacities. So let me begin uh, with the reformists and the Ahmadinejad, and the so-called anti-Ahmadinejad front and their miscalculation. Obviously, they, their foremost miscalculation on the part of the expanded ranks of the Iranian elite who ended up standing behind Mir Hossein Musavi was their belief that although a degree of uh, electoral manipulation was the name of the game in Iran and a given in Iranian politics, massive manipulation was unlikely. Now, in that miscalculation, I also plead guilty. I really did not think that massive manipulation in Iranian politics was a likely thing. And in fact, I thought, and the reformists thought, that this massive manipulation would be a dangerous exercise. Hence, it would not be tried for its destabilizing effects. They understood from the beginning that their path to winning the presidency was a difficult one dependent on their ability to mobilize a large sector of Iran's silent voting bloc, which constitutes uh, Iranian specialists uh, inside Iran, uh, um, suggests is up to 40% of the electorate. They entered the race highly skeptical of Mr. Musavi's ability to expand the participation red, but they did assume, wrongly as it turned out, that if he did indeed manage to mobilize that block of silent voters, he could overcome, the figures vary, five to seven million vote deficit he had to contend with because of the conservative ability to marshal organized votes of supporters, stuff ballots, void ballots, some, the kind of things that they do regularly uh, or, and have done in the past few elections in Iran. Once former reformist president Mohammad Khatami withdrew his candidacy, they did not, simply did not take into account the possibility of security forces loyal to the office of the leader, to the system, whatever you want to call it, reacting the way they did to a Musavi presidency, particularly since Musavi had made his commitment to the Islamic Republic very clear, and his commitment throughout his campaign Musavi made clear efforts to bring in the Basiji forces into his campaign, talked about those forces as essentially being the backbone of the revolution. The model they still operated, the reformists still operated on, was the 1997 model, when close to 80% participation pressured the highest authorities of their country to assure a fell election out of the concern for popular election. In 1997, the Friday prayer a sermon on the Friday before the election was given by Mr. Rafsanjani. He came out, he said, and he assured the public that there's not going to be a fraud. Okay, and remember, he was also the president of Iran at that time. And on Wednesday before the election, um, Ayatollah Khamenei came out and assured the public that there was not going to be fraud. So, um, so the reformists, once they had mobilized the population, the reformist camp assumed that the same pressures will be at play. And the genuine shock uh, expressed by Musavi along with the population was the direct result of this miscalculation. Now on the conservative side, the miscalculation occurred in the opposite direction. 
what they underestimated was first the ability of the reformist candidates, uh, particularly the largely uncharismatic Musavi at the time of the election, to energize what to them was, uh, was considered to be very happily um, a relatively cynical electorate. The conservatives in Iran are very happy when about 60% of the electorate votes because they can say more Iranians vote than the United States. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, because of the split, because of the support they have among a good chunk of the population, they can bring their base and with a little bit of fiddling and manipulation win all the elections with 60% participation rate. Um, they knew that with a 60% participation rate and the narrative that they had built, that Mr. Ahmadinejad is popular in the countryside and the rural areas and is a man of the people, it would not be a difficult argument to sell that he really did get 60% of the vote because he has been passing around the oil money, he has been good to the poor, and so on, and in fact has bought the votes. That really didn't matter to them that people would think that way. What they really thought is important for everyone to agree that people actually went into the uh, voting station and voting for the man. So that was one underestimation, that this rise in the participation rate. Secondly, they underestimated the impact of the debates had in energizing the population, in seeing the election as a, context, a contest between real alternatives having confidence in their man's aggressiveness and debating capabilities, they simply did not grasp the impact of Ahm Ahmadinejad's comfort with telling lies on national television and furthermore the impact of other candidates standing their grounds and in engaging in a pushback. Thirdly, <clears throat> um, uh, and this is the most contentious part of my argument, they did not feel the necessity to adjust the model of Ahmadinejad receiving two-thirds of the vote once the participation rate threatened to become 80 percent. So I'm making an argument that they were planning to cheat. Somewhere in the process, you know, the ground under them shifted and rather than adjusting to that shifting ground and making their scenario more viable by, for example, reducing you know, saying Mr. Ahmadinejad won by 52 percent, they still maintain their two-third uh, scenario. While they must have known that the additional voters beyond 60 percent have historically voted for change and never entered the fray in order to vote for status quo, they simply chose to ignore this reality, probably because, and this was their fourth miscalculation, they underestimated the role of pre-election rallies, uh, the role these rallies had in um, creating networks and links among people of different backgrounds that could be mobilized. You know, these rallies inside Iran were extremely important, not only because you had uh, people from all over um, 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 Strata, uh, every strata of the society, the reality was that for the first time they were meeting each other in the streets and telling each other, yeah, I'm a Musavi supporter too. I wear chador, you don't, but we both support, you know. So people, there was a bonding in the street that broke down that narrative that has been created in Iran that it's only the North Tehranis that are opposed to the Islamic regime. This wasn't about that. This was an election and people saw on the streets that they were on the same side um, and they connected and this was underestimated. At the end, like their reformist counterparts, the conservatives also assumed certain similarities to the events of late 1990s. Uh, when student demonstrations were prevented from, as uh, Robin pointed out, from uh, uh, spreading across the population through the use of sporadic but very effective um, um, kind of violence, which I can, I like to describe as goon violence. Uh, the indiscriminate use of plain clothes 
club wielders attacking a small group of a population, usually students in the dormitories. In this election, the first series of violence again occurred in the student dormitories before the massive demonstrations. They went immediately into the student uh, dormitories, starting beating up the students in order to cause fear and send everybody home. That has been the method of control in the Islamic Republic for the past 20 years. Now, it was the failure uh, of this system of crowd control to put a quick end uh, to demonstrators that ultimately forced the hand of the leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, to enter the fray with full force, use the card that he had not been forced to use, and probably shouldn't have been used, should have, shouldn't have used until later to effectively take the responsibility for the fraud and violence uh, that began to take place. Um, um, and ultimately, effectively identifying itself, himself, with the part of the government in Iran that has always been in the shadows um, and willing to impose violence on the Iranian population. It's important to understand what Mr. Khamenei did in his Friday prayer speech. He not only threatened violence, he also made clear that the ideological fight about the future of your uh, country, in that ideological fight, he stands with Ahmadinejad and not the other icon of the Islamic Republic, uh, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani. He made clear that in the months and years to come, it is really his office that will be the bastion standing against compromise with popular sentiments for less austere political system, as well as compromise with the outside world. In one quick step, in effect, he made Ahmadinejad look very small and insignificant in comparison to the titans who are fighting for the future of the country. Now, we will probably never know uh, what led Mr. Khamenei, um, as it is said in Persian, to incur costs for his office in order to give support to Iran's um, most political, uh, pol uh, pol politically pol polarizing uh, political figure. Um, and as I said, it is significant that in the Friday prayer, um, uh, he went further that he really needed to go. Um, and uh, not only he threatened violence, but also revealed that the deep, uh, the deep ideological fissures that have mired the Islamic Republic, um, and he also um, uh, revealed that his office, as uh, mandated by the Constitution, is not the consensus builder, but partisan, fueling instead of uh, uh, dampening, inciting schisms rather than alleviating them. Of course, this is something that many people suspected in Iran and whispered about it. But to publicly align his office with the hardline security status of the country in the minds of many in Iran, uh, who in the minds of many in Iran are responsible for Ahmadinejad's presidency was a line um, that the leader had not tried to cross before. Um, and throughout the election, tried assiduously to suggest uh, that he was not going to try to cross, and in fact, a Musavi presidency or an Ahmadinejad presidency would be fine with him. So as far as I'm concerned, the big question is why the change? In retrospect, it was probably the extensive mobilization of the electorate that must have frightened um, the hardline sector of the Iranian elite in general, and of course, the office of leader in particular. I use the language of fear intentionally here because the only explanation that I think I can think of in trying to understand Mr. Khamenei's costly move is a sense of ex extreme threat which is made even more odd when one considers the fact that this sense of threat, as is reflected in the constant refrain about the British involvement in the, uh, Iran and the Velvet Revolution, this sense of threat occurred precisely at the moment was when Iran was at its strongest in relation to upcoming negotiations with the United States. And Mr. Khamenei, by giving support to a popularly elected president, could have made his name lasting in Iran's history, not as uh, the leader of Iran's anti-democratic forces, 
That's how his name will go down in history at this time, at least. But as the leader that was effective in his pushback of aggressive U.S. policies that were implemented during the Bush administration. It has now um, become a common wisdom in Washington to suggest that what has happened in Iran is an effective takeover of the Revolutionary Guards over the Iranian political system. And it is indeed possible that I this election was an attempted capstone of a process that has been going on for a while, an attempted takeover of the Islamic State by the security establishment whose public face for now is Ahmadinejad and perhaps Mr. Khamenei himself. Aside from the fact that the history of punditry on Iran should warn us against any such, con such kind of common wisdoms, the reality of Iranian politics seems at once a lot more complicated and yet more sim simple. If indeed this was an attempted coup, because of the way it was conducted, and despite the fact that it can probably, as uh, uh, Robin suggested, can cow some people for a period of time, um, to accept the new arrangement. It has exposed deeper rifts that exist in Iran and Iran's place in the world and the contours of state society relations that cut across all institutions and strata of the society. I mean, it is a fact that as we sit here today and for example, talk about revolutionary guards in Iran and their takeover of the Iranian political system, none of us have any sense of the structure of the Revolutionary Guard and who actually runs them. And yet we feel free to make um, 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 uh, commentary about this reality that presumably an institution has, there has been a military coup in Iran. What I suggest is that the deep rifts that have been exposed in Iran in the past couple of weeks suggest to us that these rifts cut across both the society and various institutions of the Islamic Republic. And the rift is essentially about different visions and the ability of those contending visions to fight it out in a peaceful way, win or lose, via a game that is not rigged and takes everyone's citizenship seriously and does not try to purge the other side out of the political system. This election once again confirmed that a large sector of the Iranian population and elites yearn and have been yearning for decades, Robin said, a century, true, to have a say in the policy direction of the country. 30 years ago, it came out into the street and made a revolution in order to make the same point. On June 12, 15, 17, and again came out to make the same uh, point through an election. Uh, let me end by just saying that on June 11th, I was marveling at the fact that Iran had come a long way since 1979. The uh, population was no longer wishing the, to reshape the structure of the state, was no longer revolutionary, but insisting still on its way, on its say, in the policy direction of the country. It was making a choice between two candidates that in the process of election had convinced the electorate, you know, rightly or wrongly, that they would lead the country in different domestic and foreign policy directions. By June 13, and continuing today, it is clear that Iran's century-old uh, yearning for an end to arbitrary rule and creation of set of agreed upon rules that could manage and moderate conflicts and competition has yet again not been fulfilled. Uh, yet, you know, the reaction to what has happened suggests to us that there is still a lot to go. So the Islamic Republic remains in limbo, still searching to find a compromise solution to the fundamental contradiction of a populist and anti-imperialist revolution that cannot find the proper balance of accommodation among its contending forces, both social forces as well as political for forces that all want to have to say in the direction of the country but cannot get along. As such, it keeps itself open to periodic and unpredictable outbursts unless it manages to put in place rules that are accepted by both sides and can resolve the conflict in a peaceful solution. Thank you, Faraday.
Excellent. Our third comment is by Faraborz Hadar, who is a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. And in an academic vein, he holds the William A. Schreier Chair of Global Management and is director of the Center for Global Business Studies at Pennsylvania State University. As his positions imply, he will focus on the economy in Iran. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, can you hear me in the back, everything? Yes, no? Yes. Great. Um, what I'm going to look at uh, this afternoon is really going to look at the economic condition in Iran and what really brought about the dissatisfaction, if it was in fact an economic dissatisfaction, which it partially was. And I'm going to look at the economy in two ways. I'm going to look at, in fact, Robin mentioned the unity, vulnerability. I wrote that down. I thought that was very important because that has implications in the economic point of view. She also mentioned the role of Larry Johnny. I'm going to try that, tie that in there. I think he's going to play a role in that situation. And Ferry, that was kind enough to ring up the Revolutionary Guard. And I think uh, definitely there's going to be some influence in that in the economic front. But what I'm going to try to do first is look at the general economy in total. And the first chart that I have up there really looks at Iranian oil exports. And I want you to notice two things, and we'll come back to that over again. Uh, prior to the Islamic Revolution, we were running around five, six million barrels a day, of which close to five was exported. Uh, the economic crisis that followed um, in 79, the dropped to 3.3. In 80, it dropped to about 1.3. They managed to bring it up to four, but at this stage, um, it's running around four, four and a half million barrels a day, but they're only able to export two and a half because local consumption has risen very rapidly. The director of the NIOC International Division was interviewed yesterday in Dubai, and he said that he thought he was under the impression that the oil exports had not been hurt. I don't know what that means. But I suspect that we're still running somewhere around there. Now, if you so this is the consumption, this is the export, uh, uh, crude oil export. You can see it's sort of stabilized around two. If you look at oil export uh, over production, again, it's going down. Um, the other thing that people talk about is the gas sector. Iran is the second largest gas producer, a uh, gas reserve holder in the world. Um, yes, yet it is actually a gas importer, a natural gas importer. Now, the line is very, very close, and depending on which statistic you look at, they cross each other. Uh, but in terms of dollar amounts, even though it may be self-sufficient in natural gas, it's exporting some gas to Turkey at a subsidized price while importing it from Turkmenistan at, at, at a higher price. So they actually, this is a drain on the economy from a foreign... The GDP growth rate has been quite erratic. You can see a drop right after the uh, Islamic Revolution. And, and surprisingly, despite the fact that oil prices have been quite high in the past two, three years, the growth rate has been around four, five, six percent, and recently has actually dropped. This, despite the fact that oil revenue has just gone through the roof. So the question then becomes, you know, what's going on? And you have to look at the fundamentals of the Iranian economy. And we have a lot of experts in the room that are probably more expert than I am. But when we look at it, um, right now, uh, we have an economy where the government is really around 30, 35 percent, maybe 38 percent of the economy. Add to that the role of the bonyads, or the foundations, which are again another 30 percent. So you have a private sector that is maybe 35%. Despite that, I think that that's even a distorted number because the large projects that are supposedly given to the, to the private sector end up being given to senior members of the Revolutionary Guard. Okay? In fact, three huge projects were just in the past year given out. One was a $1.3 billion project for gas to be shipped from southern Iran to the border, pipelines to be drawn from the, southern board, from the southern gas fields of Iran to the border of Pakistan. That project is not finished, but the contract has been given out to, again, a leader of the Revolutionary Guard. 
uh, an upgrade and expansion of the metro system in Tehran, which is about $2.3 billion, was also given to the same Revolutionary Guard person. And the Pars gas field uh, upgrade, which is another $2.5 billion, was given to the same group. So if you follow the money, which is what we do at the business school, um, you basically say, look, you got 30 35% directly controlled by the, by the government. And if you look what Ahmadinejad did after he became president, within the first year he changed 10,000 people in various levels of the organization. Now that, that's a huge number, okay? I mean, just think of a Republicans go Democrats come, you know, they remove, they don't remove 10,000 people, okay? So th that's a substantial impact on the economy. Then the Bonyads also share some of the money, and then the private sector is basically biased towards the Revolutionary Guards. And if you look at it from a sectoral point of view, the service sector is actually the largest, maybe around 45, 50. But if you look at the service sector, what do they consist of? They consist of a telecom, publicly owned, transportation, bonyard owned, um, railroads, publicly owned. I mean, you go through it, the economy is really a governmental slash bonyard slash revolutionary guard economy. Um, when I was in graduate school, I read a book written by one of my mentors that basically looked at Iran in a dual economy, separating oil from the rest of the economy. I was always intrigued by that. And about four years ago at Penn State, we did a study of long-term trends and looked at democracy. And something interesting hit me. And that is that democracies came about because the central government taxed people and people started getting upset and wanted to tell them how to run the show. And this is kind of an interesting historical thing. Uh, the French Revolution occurred when the king was taxing the French at 11%, West Africa at 10%, and the Chinese emperor at 9%, and many of the Maharajas around 11%. So it seems to be that 10% is about it. If you tax people more than 10%, off with the king's head. Now, if you're going to tax them more than that, then the, then the people have to have a say in how you're going to do it. Yes, you can tax me more, but you're going to have to build hospitals, you're going to give me security, or you're going to give me you know, education, et cetera. That, by the way, just a side note, my wife is Lutheran, and I made a presentation to the Lutheran Brotherhood, and they started laughing when I said that. And I said, why are you laughing? And said, don't you know, even God expects you to pay 10%. So even God has figured out that 10% <laughs> is it. Yes. Okay. That's the going rate. Right. So, so if you tax... But the difficulty with oil exporters, gold exporters, diamond exporters, etc., is that the money goes into the central government. And the central government then allocates the money. And then that becomes a big hassle. The voice of the people is important, but by golly, I want the money under my control. Now, the situation in Iran is really, um, well, th this is uh, gasoline imports. I may come back to that, too. So not only are they gas self-sufficient, the gasoline, 40% of the gasoline is imported. Um, but w what has happened, what has happened is there is a debate on who gets the money, okay? Are the Bonyaz getting the money? And if you looked at the first debate, uh, and I looked at it, you know, Ahmadinejad came over de debating with Musavi, and the first thing he said, you know, I have these files, and I'm not debating one person, I'm debating you, and Khatami, and, and Rafsanjani. Why bring that? Then he says, I've got these files. Now, files in English sounds very neutral, but in Persian it's parvandi. Now, parvande means I got something on you. This is not just a file. This is something that can take you to jail. That brought up the whole debate, and all of a sudden we saw the unity break apart, which Robin so eloquently described. And this is, this is really a debate between Rafsanjani and his team, and Khamenei slash Ahmadinejad as his team, and how is the money going to be separated and discussed. That is my opinion. Now, what's the role of um, 
What's the role of the economy? Well, look at what's happened to housing. This is housing in Tehran. They hit a recession. It's gone from 500 to around 2,000, much, much faster than the inflation rate. Wheat imports gone through the roof. Iran was more or less self-sufficient in food. Now imports of food have gone through the roof. Inflation has just gone through the roof. Yes, the central government is giving them money, but the salaries are not keeping up with inflation. So people are getting upset now. Again, in the presentation, everybody showed numbers, and you can fool people with statistics in many ways. But And then there's some way you take the inflation of this month and multiply it by 12 to get the inflation. You look at it by year by year. But in any case, this is central bank. This is the central bank of Iran, Banca Markazi data. It shows that you know inflation was running around 25% last year. It's dropped now because of the recession around 15 16%. If you add to unemployment, and unemployment is kind of, sorry, sorry, thank you, thank you, Robert. And if you look at unemployment, unemployment is kind of an interesting statistics too, because the government gives you all sorts of statistics. It's fifteen percent, now it's seventeen percent, eighteen percent, and you know I, I have no way of judging this except to look at again the aggregate of the numbers. If you look at the aggregate of numbers, they're roughly around 70 million population of Iran. 20 million are either too young or too old, so that leaves you around 50 million in the workforce. Yet the Ministry of Labor says there's 25 million people in the workforce. So what happened to the other 25? You say, well, they're women. Well, that's not quite true either, because if you look at the 25 million people who are employed, eight million are women. So roughly one out of every three in the workforce is a woman. Okay? So if you take that out, take 25 of the million are women, eight million are working, and the others, well, you know, women can't work. I, I didn't say that. I'll get in trouble with my wife <laughs> okay, and my daughters. But if you assume the other women stay at home and don't even want to work, so the unemployment is not an issue, of the 25 million remaining, there's a 33% unemployment. Okay, so unemployment is running not around 15, 16 percent, but something in the 20s. Okay, add the 20s to the 20 percent inflation, and as you get older, you remember all sorts of indices. We used to have a misery index, and as, as uh, older people in the room remember, misery index that was inflation plus interest uh, plus un unemployment rate, or interest rate plus unemployment rate, which are correlated. And in the peak of the period where we talked about the U.S. economy was in terrible shape, we had an interest rate of 17 percent, inflation around 18 percent, unemployment around 7, 8 percent. That was 28 percent. And that's, as far as I remember, I'm getting pretty old, that was the worst situation. We've got a misery index in Iran that is running somewhere in the order of 40 to 45 percent. So economy plays a big role. Now what happened, oil prices went up, and Ahmadinejad went around, gave money all over the place. It's fair enough. Couldn't have given that much money. He probably gave some of the billion that they say he took, or maybe another billion in the government. It doesn't, in, you know, in today's billions is not a lot of money. But that's basically what he did, okay? Now, but the misery index is very, very high, and they have to do something about it. Now the debate, the debate within the groups the nice debates, or do we, whether we take the money and distribute it among the public, Ahmadinejad's position, or do we take the money and invest in real the sector, Rafsanjani's position. But in actual fact, it is need, none of the above. Here's the unemployment statistics, and you can see why unemployment is so high. Um, there's really very, if you look at where the growth of the population is, the population, they haven't had, women are not having that many kids in Iran anymore. They used to, okay? But uh, you need to have about 2.05 to keep the population intact. It used to be around 2.7, 2.8, and so you saw the spurge. But right now, women are having less than one. So the economic condition is actually having women have less kids. So what you see, in essence, is a drop in the age group between five and nine, particularly, okay? And this reflects on where the workforce is. Now, I compared Yemen, U.S., and Iran, and you can see that's where they got to find jobs for people. You know, 30 percent unemployment is just unbelievable. Okay. By the way, in the fourth development plan, they are hoping that they will produce 700,000 jobs a year. 
that's in the plan, that's the optimistic situation. 700,000 jobs a year means that there's 300,000 people still per year won't get a job. They need roughly a million jobs a year to keep the situation intact. So, here's under 34, 15 to 34, you can see Iran is very high. <laughs> And inflation, some people say, was well, because oil prices went up and inflation was really, really high. Oil prices went up for Saudi Arabia, too. They had a lot more oil. Their inflation didn't do anything the way Iran. They're just spending money like crazy rather than investing. Okay. They're importing everything. The stock market has done miserably. Engineering and technical services have gone down. Food industry has gone down. Sugar industry has gone down. Construction has gone down. So, where does that leave us? The economy is in a mess. Unemployment is running at 25, 30%. Inflation is running at 20. And they're debating how to invest the money. But behind the scene is who's going to control the purse? And I think that's where the big debate is. Is it going to be controlled by Ahmadinejad giving projects to the Revolutionary Guard, or is it going to be controlled more in line with the Bunyads and the Ayatollahs? And that's why the issue is between, in my opinion, between Rafsanjani and a group of Ayatollahs, and Khamenei and Ahmadinejad and another group of Revolutionary Guards. And I love the picture of all the generals sitting there because those are the guys who get the money, not the people. And that's why the question of who really controls the Revolutionary Guard, which was brought up by, by Faraday, is very, very important. And we don't know. But the unity and vulnerability becomes a key issue, and it's basically them fighting over the money that they're making selling outside. And that's kind of a... So the outcome will be partially related to who will control the money. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Farabars. Our last presentation is by Emil El Okayim, who is political editor of The National in Abu Dhabi. He's also a non-resident research fellow at the Stimson Center, and he will focus his comments on the impact of this election and the protests on the Gulf and larger region. Emil. Thanks. Um, well, thanks to Robin, we know that uh, the public contestation in Iran is entering a, a new phase uh, that's probably more diffuse, opaque, and protracted than what we've seen in, in the previous weeks. And um, in, a, in a way, that, that makes it harder for all the countries in the region, spe specifically in the Arab world, to, to have a good sense of, of what's happening in Iran and, and how this will play out over, over the coming uh, weeks and, and months. But it's, it's pretty important to examine at this point the implications for Middle East security and Middle East politics of, of the very profound changes that, that have affected Iran recently. And in a way, much will depend on, on how these various players, those various countries, um, and including the, uh, the great powers, uh, will assess the, the nature of the system that is emerging from the, the turmoil um, in, in Iran. Um, Seen from, from the Middle East, and more specifically from the Arab Gulf states, uh, that much is certain. Uh, the Islamic Revolution has entered its second age uh, ever since uh, the election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005. And this new age uh, has several main uh, traits, characteristics. The growing assertiveness of the once timid uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. Uh, the momentously important uh, political and economic rise of the Revolutionary Guards, and the alienation of previously very important key power centers, including clerical ones with which um, the, the Gulf states had rebuilt ties in, in the 90s, and the rejection of popular legitimacy in favor of raw control in, in Iran. Um, we have to understand something uh, very, very important about how Iran is seen from uh, the other uh, side of, of uh, the Gulf. Here we see Iran as, um, we look back uh, to 1979 and we see a very bumpy road. We see factionalism playing out. We see kind of, you know, controlled chaos, competing power centers. Uh, we, 
it's this is not how uh, most uh, Gulf leaders see Iran, and I would argue most uh, Arab leaders. Um, they see continuity. They see linear, linearity since 1979. They see the revolution as having a profound motive, coherence, a consistency that is not well, well or um, th that is not well understood in the West, a kind of naivete here that we have about the system. We want to see the nuances where they see a, a purpose-driven system that is fundamentally expansionist, hegemonic. Um, and, and this is, and so what is the, the, the assessment today about, about this new Iran? I mean, new, not much has changed in, in, in the formal structure of power, but the reality of power is, is, is probably very different. So the assessment right now is that um, we can no longer talk about Iran as an Islamic republic. It is a consolidating Islamic military dictatorship within our power base. And many in the Arab world will argue that this was always the case and that recent events in the past uh, uh, two, three weeks have just railed, uh, raised the veil on the democratic pretense that the Islamic Republic has cultivated deceptively for the past 30 years. So in that sense, uh, the re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, was good news in the sense that it does, it does away with the illusion of a moderate Iran that is searching its way. It's actually, you see the true face of Iran and the true face that may, many gullible, naive Westerners pin their hopes on. Um, Actually, many Arab colonists and many of my, uh, my colleagues uh, argue that Ahmadinejad simply won the election fair and square, that this is the fundamental reality of, of Iranian politics and that we need to, um, uh, to, we need to make our peace with that. This is a, a judgment I would personally dispute. Um, but we have to understand the logic of that. It's, it's a little bit twisted, but it's certainly understandable. Um, Gulf leaders uh, have been very disappointed uh, by Rasanjani and Khatami in the sense that these were uh, business-minded uh, people with whom they could talk. Uh, Khatami was very soft-spoken. There they were good personal relations between some of the leaders. I mean, I'm not going to, going to overstate that, but you have to realize that in the 80s, the Gulf state had supported Iraq in the Iraq-Iran war and were very concerned about Iran's uh, agenda in, in the Gulf, um, Bahrain and, and uh, Saudi Arabia and, and other places. So they were rebuilding that relationship in, in the 90s with Rafsanjani and then, and then Khatami. Um, but then they realized something in 2002, that Iran uh, had pushed ahead with its nuclear program and that the good face of Iran, Khatami, for example, was uh, hiding a, a more determined security policy, still very aggressive, that Iran was really after a nuclear option uh, at the time that they were, you know, trying to rebuild confidence between, between the two shores of, of the Gulf. Um, and, and, and this still has an impact about how the Gulf looks at, at Iran today. Um, I mean, another reason why uh, I think uh, many in the Arab world are, are happy that uh, Ahmadinejad or in a way relieved that Ahmadinejad won, is that a Musavi presidency uh, would have had um, an impact on the, probably at least in their view, a positive impact on the U.S.-Iran relationship. And this is a prospect that unnerves a number of Arab states that are somehow convinced that Iran's interest and, and even uh, that Washington's interest and, and even Washington's heart uh, is closer, are closer to Tehran than Arab capitals. This is, a, in a way, in a, and you would argue, you can argue an irrational fear, uh, but you know, look when you look at the history and the close relationship uh, between the U.S. and Iran during the Shah times, uh, not completely uh, um, misplaced. So, uh, as I said earlier, um, little has changed in the formal structure of power in Iran, uh, but. Those on the rise right now um, are, uh, belong to the most radical and uncompromising faction. I mean, uh, power right now is at least seen from, uh, from, uh, from the Arab world um, is firmly in the hands of a Praetorian guard with a v very dominant say in security and foreign policy. 
um, a uh, driving policy on the nuclear program, Iran, um, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, other places, um, a Praetorian Guard that upholds fundamentalist and uh, uh, values, but also has a very nationalistic outlook, a combination that concerns the, the Arab states, and also a Praetorian Guard that has little knowledge of and, and few connections to the outside world uh, beyond uh, Syria, Hezbollah operatives, and the likes of Hugo Chavez. Um, and so uh, there's very little good news and, and even fewer interlocutors for, for the Arab states in, in, Tehran, um, in, in Tehran right now. Um, they, they're all speculating at this point about Iran's coming behavior. And, and I think it will largely depend on the Iranian leadership reading of, of the protest. Um, after all, the, the only real threat Khamenei really worried about was uh, you know, a Western-backed color revolution. And guess what? It happened. That threat materialized. Um, so if, I mean, if, the, if Iranian leaders uh, mean what they say when they blame the protests, the contestation in, in the streets of Tehran and, and other Iranian cities on, on the West, um, then what you might see is you know, the rise of a more confrontational and even angrier Iran uh, using uh, its assets abroad to retaliate, counter what they see as an existential threat. This is if Ahmadinejad and Khamenei mean what they're saying publicly, that the US, the UK, other countries are driving that, that, that process. Uh, if they have the courage to acknowledge that the popular movement was the result of a profound domestic discontent, um, then Iran may become more inward looking and in a way freeze its <coughs> operation investments abroad. I'm, I'm just outlining two extreme scenarios. I think it's, it's going to some, be somewhere in the middle. But this is a little bit how they're, they're thinking it, uh, about it. But, so no one is, is, um, is really confident about, about the next phase. But f seen from the Arab world, at least it has the, the, the merit of clarity. You know what you're dealing with. Uh, up until now, there was a lot of fuzziness and all our debates here uh, about you know, which faction can you deal with in Iran and are there people who are more willing to reach a compromise on the nuclear fine and so uh, were really uh, unnerving many, many Gulf uh, and, and Arab leaders. Uh, in a way, uh, they think this is no, no longer the case. There is another, um, there is another element here. Um, which is, uh, I mean, right now you could argue that uh, the U.S. is in a better tactical position than it was before the elections. I mean, uh, a weak and contested Ahmadinejad, an inward-looking Iran, uh, the defeat of Hezbollah in the Lebanese elections uh, earlier this month. Um, you know, there is a sense, I mean, I've read uh, in some uh, uh, papers here that, uh, you know, Washington feels a little bit better. but. That doesn't change the fundamental uh, uh, question on the nuclear front. Uh, centrifuges are still spinning. They would have sp spun if uh, Mousavi ha was in power. I mean, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This time is not on the U.S. side. So this is, a, this is a, it, at most, is a respite. Um, so from the Gulf states, what they see is that this over U.S. overture uh, to Iran is going to be certainly complicated by, by recent events. I mean, the Obama administration has tried not to uh, uh, be too uh, confrontational um, and I think has been, I think, pretty successful uh, uh, at that. But it will complicate an already very complicated relationship, but the, the overture will also likely be postponed, which, you know, um, and again, with time uh, not on the U.S. side, um, the even less progress on, on the nuclear file, which is not a very good news for, um, um, for, for the Arab and, and the, the Gulf states. There is also the fear that, um, that Iran's hardliners, uh, now that they're cornered and, and, and fear, I mean, are faced with internal contestation and foreign pressure um, to our converging, that actually a nuclear option is more palpable, I mean, even more desirable right now. This is speculation. I'm not saying that's my, uh, my opinion, but this is at, at least one uh, line of thinking. 
But there is a, another very important dimension here. Um, the Arab states are finding some relief in that crisis in the sense that Iran's image has been uh, substantially uh, eroded, has uh, suffered a lot from, from what the Arab world has seen on, on, on television. I mean, the Arab world has a very, uh, I would say, simplistic and romanticized version of Iran. It's they're evil, either evil or they're the model to follow. Uh, right now, what, what Arabs have seen on, on their TV screens is that not all Iranians are actually happy with the choices of, of their government. They're not all on board with a very confrontational um, um, uh, foreign policy, that actually they, they resent the, the country's ideological isolation that comes at an enormous cost for them. I mean, I've, I've seen some slogans uh, in, uh, in, uh, that basically were saying, uh, no, to, uh, no to Gaza, no to Lebanon, uh, we're here for Iran. I mean, things like that. I don't know how widespread that was. But at least from, f from the point of view of Arab leaderships, uh, it's actually good to have uh, Iran's image uh, uh, tarnished. They suffered from uh, you know, Ahmadinejad taking the lead on uh, on confrontation with Israel, and it made them. F I mean, they, they appeared weak and and essentially lackeys of the West for not for not going on board. And now contestation comes from within Iran, and that's important. Um, there's also a, another uh, element here, which is um, that uh, Iran's allies in the region, um, although they they won't see an immediate difference in their interaction with their Tehran must have been a little bit confused by, by what they saw in, in, the streets, in the streets of Iran. I mean, um, Hezbollah, for instance, uh, upholds Iran as a model. I mean, talks about Vilayat of Fakih and other things. Um, you know, imagine, I mean, the impact of the images in, in, um, uh, of, of the repression in the streets of Tehran has, have had an effect in, in Beirut. I mean, don't forget, in 2005, the Lebanese had their own uh, a version of this popular uprising, uh, no blood, no massive repression, uh, but still they're like they're wondering what kind of state uh, you know do we want? I mean, is that is that a, a viable model for us? Uh, another country to watch uh, very closely is uh, is Syria, which is trying uh, to rebuild ties with uh, with the West. I mean, if if well played, this can be a moment of opportunity for Syria. But I think that you know this. There is no, there's not much texture to the Iran-Syria relationship. It's not that the two societies are, you know, uh, in love and uh, exchange. There's not a lot of cultural exchanges and so on. There's some religious pilgrimage, and but it's it's not a profound uh, uh, relationship. So the Syrian regime continues will continue to deal with the same people in in Tehran, uh, but. I mean, what is their assessment of uh, of the solidity of uh, of the the regime in, in Tehran? Uh, I mean, the, the picture is, is certainly very complex. Um, as I said earlier, the only merit of of these troubles and and uh, Khamenei's dec decision to uh, uh, basically throw his weight behind Ahmadinejad is at least for the Arab states, is to clarify the situation. We're no longer uh, dealing with a, with a political elite that you know, debates option and so on. No, Iran today is controlled by the most radical, the most confrontational faction. I mean, you can dispute that judgment, I mean, and Iranian politics are, are very fluid, and I certainly appreciate your, uh, uh, your observation earlier that punditry on Iran has always, uh, you know, um, you know uh, disappointed in, in, in a way, but uh, you, you need. There is a need to to understand that it, it's uh, the Arab world doesn't even even when there's uh, the perception of the Iranian threat is is very uh, very acute. What they worry they worry as much uh, about the the West uh, uh, the Western relationship with with Iran as as they do about Iran's influence in, in the region. And right now, they feel, at least in the short term, they will feel in a better position. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Emil. Well, we have an opportunity for your questions and comments. I'd like to ask, since we have only a little under 40 minutes left, that questions be kept precise. And if you would indicate the person to whom you're directing it, that would help us sort things out here. 
Also, would you please wait for the microphone to arrive since this is being webcast and televised? And please give us your name and affiliation. Who would like to start? Gentleman here. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Thanks for a really interesting uh, series of presentations. I I'm Bob Dreyfus uh, with The Nation magazine, and uh, I spent a couple of weeks in Iran during the election. I spoke to a lot of people there all across the political spectrum who said before the election that both Ahmadinejad and Khamenei uh, had a strong interest and desire in rebuilding ties to the United States, that they want to negotiate a deal with the United States. Um, and, and these were even from very strongly pro-Musavi people who thought it would be a lot easier to do such a deal if, if their guy won. Um, um, so I wonder if you could uh, comment, uh, whoever wants to take this uh, is okay, but about whether now those calculations have been changed and put yourself in the place of these two guys who are now running the country and and what are their considerations now in figuring out whether to approach the Obama administration maybe not this week but a month or two or when the UN session opens in the fall with some sort of offer to uh, talk to the United States and of course how do you think we ought to respond you want to lead off? No, go ahead. Uh, I was there in March, and I came away with the, the feeling that the clerics, the regime had never felt so powerful, that it had so many trump cards in dealing with the United States, not just because of uh, our involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan, but just across the board. They felt um, almost cocky. And <clears throat> we're expecting, if there were an overture from the United States, and my last couple of days, uh, Obama did make his Nauru's message, but they were anticipating that, that any deal, any serious negotiations would have to involve a lot more than the United States had offered so far. It would have to be, the United States would basically have to come bearing gifts, and so, in, including a compromise on uranium enrichment. I think in the aftermath of what's happened over the past three weeks, that the regime is not going to be as self-confident about getting a deal, about having, about appearing strong, um, that its own uh, image around the world has weakened. Uh, you know, I would not be surprised if, particularly if there is continuing uncertainty in Iran, for Ahmadinejad at some point to basically reach out and say, okay, I'm ready to do business, and then force the White House in effect, to legitimize him if, they want, if it wants to engage. And I think that's where the administration comes up against a very, very difficult choice because the one thing we don't talk about, having today, believe it or not, is Iran's controversial nuclear program and questions about where it stands, what it's doing. And, you know, Ahmadinejad is the first one to come out, it has been over the past year, and say we're, we're at 5,000, we're at 7,000 centrifuges. And... Uh, if they continue to do that, that, you know, keeps the clock running. And uh, I'm sure there are many in Israel who are very aware. And the, the uncertainty in Iran, the questions about the legitimacy of the system, their calculations in Israel may be that this is a, it'll be easier to strike uh, now than it would have been if you had Mousavi elected, if you had a, uh, what looked like a legitimate election that, that uh, put uh, Ahmadinejad back in power. So I think this is a, you know, this is the worst possible confluence of factors that the Obama administration faces. Faraday, something to add? Yeah. Um, I think uh, Mr. Khamenei is faced with, you know, if things calm down, and it doesn't look like it's going to calm down that easily, but if they do, he is ultimately faced with the now what moment, you know, uh, both in terms of domestic politics and as, as far as foreign policy. It's very important, it seems to me, it's important to understand part of the reason that they decided to go for this brazen announcement of this election. 62%, Ahmadinejad even got more vote than Khatami did. Um, it was this idea that this 
internal fissures that exist in Iran are not working to Iran's side. So we have to clarify um, uh, the internal situation so we can push for the kind of policies we want to push for in terms of foreign policy as well as domestic policy. And let us uh, forget that right before this election occurred at the end of last Iranian year, the Majlis defeated Ahmadinejad on his major economic policy initiatives, which was to effectively um, withdraw uh, subsidies and uh, in, t in terms of goods and give people cash subsidies. So those issues are still on the table because the Iranian economy has to face major issues. And obviously there was a sense that by clarifying the situation and effectively coming and saying that we won, it's over, we have consolidated, revolutionary guards took over, that's it, go home you know, elections are no longer serious, don't participate anymore, they could pursue these policies. So it seems to me that not only Mr. Obama is faced with the worst possible circumstances, but so is Mr. Khamenei, because he went for something to clarify the situation, and the result is a mess. And um, uh, it is that dynamic that makes the predictions that were made prior to election um, rather problematic. Uh, um, uh, you know, within the Iranian political context, it is always the expectation that whoever consolidates power will ultimately make a deal with the outsiders. Okay? And in fact, the argument has always been that the reason reformers were not allowed to make a deal with the United States was because um, the hardliners did not want the reformers to become powerful. And now that they are going to be powerful, they're going to make a deal to assure that they will stay in power forever. I think a lot of that has to do with Iranian pathology. Uh, and um, um, secondly, I think um, what has happened has completely changed um, uh, the dynamics. Mr. Khamenei is faced with a serious question. Not only he has undermined his office by taking sides, he is now accused of mismanagement of a serious crisis of uh, uh, facing Iran. And he has to find a way to address those questions that has to do with his leadership. As I say, it doesn't have to do with the fact that is he going to be a leader or not. It has to do with the fact that he has mismanaged this whole situation in very, very consequential ways. And unless he can figure out how to address that kind of question, I don't think he can raise his head and sort of try to address the outside world. Iran, I do think, it will become rather introverted, at least for the next few months. Yes, gentleman right in the back here. Got him. Thank you. Uh, 
put the Iranian leadership in a pretty tough uh, position. I don't see any means why where time is on their side. Okay. Can you answer that in a general way? Thank you. Well, I, I see at least three questions there, but Robin, you want to take a crack at one of them? Oh, <clears throat> in terms of a parliament, I think it's a very important point, and I think that shows one of the many cracks. Uh, that's that basically less about a third of the members of parliament showed up for Ahmadinejad's victory party. I think that's very telling. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the deadline, I would caution you to to watch putting a deadline on it when its process hasn't even started yet. I think uh, President Obama has talked about a year that he wants to see something happen, which would mean uh, until January. Um, but again, this is a very fluid situation. I think in some ways it is a day-by-day -day thing that you, you can't look forward too much right now. We're only two weeks after, two and a half weeks after the election, and I think there's going to have to be a lot of settling down before that process even begins. All right, boys, would you comment a bit on the prospect that sanctions could have any further effect? I mean, do we have many more quivers or arrows in the quiver yeah, that we could um, use on the sanctions front? Um, yeah. Couple of things on the on the vulnerability. I don't think the split is just in the majlis. You see it in the assembly of experts. You see, I mean, it's just all over the place. So because of that, I don't think anything's going to happen until they sort the mess out among themselves. So that's my personal. Opinion. Now, with regard to the sanctions, let me first talk about the nuclear situation and look at the effectiveness of sanctions. Um, President Obama in Cairo sort of seemed to say that if you want nuclear power for energy, you're okay. Now, the Iranians interpreted that as, you know, concentrating uranium to 2 to 3 percent. He didn't say that, but that seemed to be the message. Um, I think that's already a done deal, okay? And let me tell you why. Um, Iran needed nuclear energy way, way back. In fact, during the Shah's era, Siemens started a nuclear power plant exactly in this location. Um, Iran was concerned about availability to uh, enrich uranium, and so the deal was struck that they would hold, I believe, 12, 13 percent. I was with the Ministry of Economy at the time. They bought 12 to 13 percent in a French operation in southern France that enriched uranium. That was the deal. When the revolution came, the nuclear power generation plant basically got reneged, and the French took over the 12, 13 percent. Now, whether they nationalized it, what happened, God knows. So the Iranians are basically saying, wait a sec, we need energy. You saw they're practically self-sufficient in gas. Oil is dropping. They need to export their oil. They need uh, electric generation. So now the question is, is this nuclear power really for energy, or are they lying to us? Iran is in a completely different situation than Korea. Korea says, I want a nuclear bomb, I have a nuclear bomb, and here's my nuclear bomb, boom. Okay? The Iranians have said, we don't want a nuclear bomb. We don't have a nuclear bomb uh, operation. We don't have facilities to go in that direction. Furthermore, it's against our religion. There's uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini says. Now, they may be lying, but that opens up a situation for us to go in there and basically look at it, supervise it, etc. Musavi said, and again, it seems that what this is what he said. I'm willing to see a uranium enrichment operation in Iran in a joint venture among many multinational companies. So presumably that means Arriva, the Russians, the Japanese, etc. I think that's about the best we can do because they want to have at least 10 nuclear power plants. They want to invest about 1 to 2 billion per power plant. They're going to be highly dependent on nuclear energy uh, in the form of electricity. And they're not going to rely on somebody from outside giving them enriched uranium. So, so I think that's done. And it doesn't really matter who becomes, who comes to power. Now, the issue of sanctions. I think the sanctions hurt the Iranian public. I think there's no question about that. But I don't think it has any effect on the Iranian regime. Okay? Um, I honestly believe it has backfired. Um, yeah, we discussed the possibility of putting sanctions on um, importation of gasoline. They used that as an excuse to ration it and put coupons on, and people want. If we put sanctions on gasoline, the administration in Iran is going to love it. You're going to jack up the price. You see, it's the American fault. 
With regard to sanctions and other sectors, we keep on looking at this and say, well, it's hurting them. Yes, it's hurting them. I wonder if they had increased their oil production to 7, 8, per, seven, eight million barrels a day, would we have had to pay $147 for a gallon of oil, for a barrel of oil? I, mean, I don't know. That's a good question. But if you look at it, our sanctions have resulted in Europe becoming dependent on Russian gas. I thought they were our allies. Okay. It's made Turkey pay for gas. If you have a Nabucco pipeline, Turkey charging 15% will be self-sufficient in natural gas consumption. They would be happy. Pakistan and India gas pipeline is just a talk. It doesn't really happen. These are all because of sanctions. So our sanctions are not only hurting the Iranian people, they're putting our European allies at risk, they're hurting the Turks, and they're damaging Pakistan and India. I don't think the sanctions have been effective, but that's a minority position. So. Well, it, it happens to be one that I think has some very strong evidence behind it, but thank you. Can I say uh, I, I don't think anything that has happened in Iran has changed uh, the limited options that the Obama administration had prior to what has happened. Um, uh, even before these things happened, you know, there were all sorts of discussions about military strikes essentially being not the viable option, that sanctions effectively harm the Iranian population and strengthen the hardliners. And I don't think anything that has happened in Iran in the past few weeks has changed that dynamics. The only thing that has changed, it seems to me, is that because election was at the center of the controversy, it is now possible, despite Mr. Khamenei's uh, making this as a systemic problem, to make an argument that there is a crack, not between reformers and conservatives, but there is a crack between the system and the government that is considered by many people in Iran to be illegitimate. Okay? So, and it is within the context of that crack that I think outside governments might start thinking about policies that actually directly harm individual members of that government. Okay, whoever identifies, is identified in terms of their ambassadors, in terms of the people they send outside. So people, for example, have talked about the possibility of political sanctions against individual members of this government. That is an opening. I'm not, you know, I mean, things are working out so fast that I don't think, I think it's time for Obama administration to sit down and assess the situation. But I think that's the only crack that has opened that introduces us to new possibilities of kind of uh, policies that Obama administration can pursue. But the old ones that were on the table uh, will still be as effective as they were before all these things happened. Let me just expand a little bit on what Mr. Beagle said about the report from the head of the Mossad uh, that report is most fully described in an article by Yossi Melman in the Daily Star of yesterday. Uh, Daily Star, published in Beirut. And the head of Mossad is quoted as saying that uh, Iran's military program would mature only in 2014. And this is a considerable change from what Mossad had been arguing which was 2009, 2010, therefore it's urgent. So in effect, the interpretation by the author of this is that the Mossad is coming out and removing a key reason that the Netanyahu government could use for an early attack, as well as for their argument to the Obama administration that we can't do Palestine first because Iran is a more urgent problem. So uh, this is an interesting comment by the head of the Mossad, not normally known for uh, engaging immediately in international politics, but uh, an interesting development to keep your uh, eye on. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, right here. Thank you. I have a question. This is Goli Kashani. I'm an independent editor for Women, Inc. Um, Robin or Dr. Farhi, maybe you could uh, um, answer this. How much validity do you give to the 
rumors of the involvement of uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani, who is systematically against a uh, theocratic state. Either one of you. Go ahead, Go ahead. <laughs> I'm engaging in rumors too. I mean, let's <laughs> let's be very clear. Um, 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 you know, Ayatollah Sistani has many many offices in Qom. I mean, Ayatollah Sistani madrasas or whatever. I mean, houses are all over Qom, and he's obviously a very influential leader, not only in Iraq but also in Iran, um, um, and um, he's. Um, uh, what is it? Um, grandson or granddaughter is now married to um, uh, Mr. Shahristani's uh, son or daughter. I don't know which one. So the uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, grandchildren uh, and Ayatollah Sistani's grandchildren are uh, have now very close family relations. And um, Ayatollah Sistani, like um, 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 many other members uh, of the clergy in Rome, is a, what is considered to be a traditional uh, um, a cleric, essentially um, not very happy with the kind of dynamics. They, they, they don't want to be uh, out of the political process. Obviously, they want to have their influence, yet at the same time cannot be very happy with the kind of dynamics that are going on. And there are reports that some people have gone to see him, and of course, uh, it's very clear that when Mr. Ahmadi Rajad went to um, uh, Iraq, Ayatollah Sistani did not meet with him, but he met with Mr. Larijani and, of course, with Mr. Rafsanjani. So I, I think he has given uh, his hints in terms of where his uh, um, um, preferences lie. And uh, it is within this con I think he falls within the context of all these activities that are going on within the clerical community. Um, uh, uh, Robin showed the picture of some of the ayatollahs that have been the more political ayatollahs in Iran that have taken a stance. Uh, but in the past week, in Iran, two major grand ayatollahs, Makarem Shirazi and Javadi Amoli, uh, have given sermons, Javadi Amoli in particular, um, um, has gave the sermon in Qom, and he hasn't done that for a while, where he came up with this idea that separation of power was a political um, uh, arrangement that existed in the early days of Islam. And in a direct rebuke to Ayatollah Khamenei that had come out and said, Let's follow the law. He came, g gave this very interesting sermon about how could you talk about uh, rule of law when uh, 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 the institution that devised the law implements the law and judges the law is the same, uh, you know, institution. So you cannot rely, and therefore you you mistrust that law. So it is for the first time that these very non-political, very uh, hesitant um, clerics are making their points that this is not going to continue. It's not working out very well. And I assume um, that Ayatollah Sistani, that has always tried to stay away. Uh, from Iranian politics also falls into that category of people that is not very, un very happy with what is going on in Iran right now. Yes, in the back. Thanks a lot. Aungshuman uh, Apte, Voice of America, India Service. Uh, I just have two quick questions. First of all, if uh, President Ahmadinejad by pressure or whatever means, if he agrees to uh, talk with the United States as far as the nuclear issue is concerned, then do you think the administration will still vehemently support the democratic forces in Iran? What will be the, the administration's position if the key issue on which uh, you know, the U.S. administration banks on, which is the nuclear uh, issue, if there is a leniency on Ahmadinejad's part to negotiate or to talk about it, uh, what happens to the democracy, democratic forces, the movement. Uh, secondly, uh, the troop pull out from Iraq, do you think it has got any implications on the Middle East or, or in Iran or uh, over Middle East in general? Thank you. Mm. Uh, I don't think the withdrawal of U.S. troops has any implications on what uh, the United States decides to do about Iran. 
Uh, I don't think the American public has an appetite for any kind of um, additional military intervention in that neighborhood. Uh, in terms of what Obama does, I think they haven't made a decision yet. I think that's the, the tough call. How do you create a balance where you seem to be uh, encouraging the democratic voices in throughout the region, not just in Iran. At the same time, you have to deal with some of the most autocratic, the last biggest block of autocratic leaders in the world. So it's a it's a challenge that he faces not only in Iran, but across the board. I think you know it was interesting what it, what he did in Egypt in deciding to give the speech there, um, but he never once mentioned Mubarak in his speech. Uh, and I think that that the issue of we have to understand that the issue of engagement is not because we ever liked who was ever was going to be in power. It's because we're trying to avoid the military option. Yes, in the back here. Um, Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. How do you think Israel and their leaders view the election and their memory of the Holocaust? I don't know about the second part of your question, but in terms of, I mean, as the pointed out, um, I mean, I would assume the Israelis uh, look at the Iranian situation and essentially see a weakened state, and therefore they are happy about that dynamic. And uh, um, they also see uh, the possibility of rapprochement between the United States, serious rapprochement beyond the technical discussion about the nuclear program, uh, more remote. And I think, uh, again, um, that um, uh, um, they see that as a plus for Israeli interest uh, in the region. Um, um, beyond that, um, uh, I think the Israelis are also watching and um, trying to make sense of uh, the direction of what is going on. But at this point, uh, uh, I think it was a welcoming, welcomed and, uh, um, addition to um, their understanding of what is going on uh, um, in the Middle East. I think their reaction is very similar. Uh, to the reaction that um, Emil described in the relationship to um, important parts of the Arab world. Emil, let me ask a question to you of if, if you posit in Arab eyes a general uh, reduced legitimacy of the government in Iran, what, what, would be, what would be your estimate of the impact on the leadership of Hezbollah and Hamas. Are they uh, somewhat put off by this? Does it make no difference at all as long as supplies and money keep coming? What have you? Well, there is a, there is a difference between uh, Hamas and Hezbollah in the sense that uh, Hezbollah is committed ideologically to the Islamic revolution. I mean, that's, that's a talking point during the elections in Lebanon, uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, said that he was proud of Vilayat al-Faqih and following it. So, um, of course, in a, I mean, imagine if the elections in Lebanon had happened after all this, uh, all this unrest in Iran, and, and I, I think you would have seen a, actually a, a, a weakening of Hezbollah's allies. I mean, in terms of communications, I mean, that's a victory for those opposed to Iran in the region. Not that they had anything to do with it, but uh, it, in a way, what was so embarrassing to them was the, this notion that um, the Islamic Republic and, and Ahmadinejad had more legitimacy, had more popular legitimacy than Arab governments themselves. And, and right now, um, Ahmadinejad himself is on shaky ground, so they, they like that. The other thing is, um, I mean, if you, Hezbollah and Hamas are not going to suffer in the sense that, you know, the support, whether it's in funding or training or weaponry, is going to continue. This is, I mean, the, the guys who are now in power, the revolutionary guards, are the ones who control that, those, these relationships, so they're not directly affected. But um, in terms of positioning, in terms of talking to their own public in, in Palestine and in, in Lebanon, uh, in terms of ideology, um, this is a setback. This is a setback. But I, I think that's, I just say something in terms of, first of all, there is, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah are completely different uh, uh, um, entities as far as Iran is concerned. And I would be very interested to know 
uh, whether or not the kind of schisms that have developed inside Iran and have become blatant are also being reproduced within Hezbollah itself. Because as many of you know, uh, the father of the Hezbollah movement is a major Musavi supporter. Uh, the former interior minister, Mohtash Amipur, is uh, Muslim Musavi's main advisor. So, and uh, Mr. Khatami has very close links familiarly as well as, um, um, uh, you know, organizationally to Hezbollah. So it would be interesting for someone to examine whether or not these kind of, this has reverberations internally within Hezbollah itself. I think you will find uh, people more committed to the Islamic revolution in downtown, in, in Dahiye than, than in Iran, um, in the sense that uh, many of the Hezbollahis still romanticize have this, this idea of the revolution. They don't have to go through it, uh, so that, that makes it easier. Uh, but but I, I think that you have a core. Now, how large that core is, I'm, I don't think it, I think it's you know, 20, 30 percent of Hezbollah. It's not uh, the overwhelming majority. But there is another element, and you were mentioning all the, the Ayatollahs who were taking a principal stand against uh, Ahmadinejad, Khamenei, and so on. I mean, add to your list uh, uh, Fadlallah. I mean, this is a major marja uh, uh, in, in Lebanon, uh, someone who has had very tense relations with Khamenei uh, over the years, uh, doesn't accept the light of Fakir, doesn't want someone to uh, you know, supersede him on domestic uh, Lebanese Shia affairs, religious uh, thing. Um, so you have that, that dimension. Um, I, the fact, the thing is, it won't have any tangible direct political impact because uh, events in Lebanon are driven right now by, by, by other factors, but we're entering just a new process, a new, a new phase uh, right now. Uh, we'll see where, where it goes. See a hand back here, but I can't uh, see much more than that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sana Manderlini, I'm a research affiliate. Um, I wanted to come back to the question of what's going on in the U.S. At the moment, we have a divestment bill being pushed in Congress by APAC, and, and some are saying that, this, that it's being framed as uh, its divestment uh, from the oil and uh, gas sector in Iran, and some are saying now that pa passing this bill would be supportive of the Green Movement and Musavi's efforts. So I wanted you to talk about what the political implications of something like this would be. Um, what the economic implications are broadly for, for the Iranian public, but, and also what the economic implications are for the parts of the IRGC that have an interest in the oil and gas sector. All right, Bort, you want to? Um, sure, I'll, I'll try. Um, I honestly believe that we've already put enough constraints on the oil and gas, uh, and uh, any additional one would just reinforce what the Chinese are doing and what the what the Russians are doing. The Russians, uh, I don't think we have to worry too much about the Russians because they put up a good talk, but really they don't want to do it, so they'll pretend they want to do it. But the Chinese and the Indians are very interested in it, and um, I, I think that as time goes by, if we really isolate them completely, they'll completely shift to the east, and we'll wake up one day, and, and, and we don't have any leverage, and we don't have any capability. So that's what... Um, but if I may go back to the Israel question, um, uh, I really think the Israelis are just sitting there and watching, just like we all are. Okay, we don't know what's going to happen. Okay, I mean we can speculate, but you can have a an optimistic scenario, my optimistic scenario, that the assembly of experts will get together and Larry Johnny will play a big role, and they'll sort of get together and they'll maybe have not one supreme leader but a council of leaders that they'll reduce the power of the Guardian Council, the Majlis will be more powerful, and maybe Ahmadinejad will stay or maybe will not, but we'll shift gradually towards a real Jumhuriya um, but We translate it as Islamic Republic, but in Farsi it's Republic Islamic. We'll tr transfer and gradually go in that direction. If that happens, I think that will be a very, very good move. And it'll be very, and I think the Israelis will be happy with it, because we will put controls in place to make sure that the nuclear generation is really nuclear generation. And the question really becomes, why are we supporting Hezbollah and why are we supporting Hamas? In the election, Israel was really not an issue in Iran. I mean, Israel is an issue here. It's Israel is not an issue in Iran, I don't think. 
Okay. The pessimistic side, however, is that the Revolutionary Guards are in much more powerful position than we think. That in fact Khomeini supported Ahmadinejad because he was afraid of the Revolutionary Guards. If that's the case, we're moving towards a dictatorship, and that's what Freda was insinuating. And we're moving into not a military dictatorship, but a dictatorship of thugs. Because the military is played out of the thing. The military is completely out. I mean, in the past 72 hours, there's been military you know, maneuvers. The Army had one. The Navy had one. The Air Force had one. I have no idea what that means. But, but the military is having some maneuvers. But the problem is the Revolutionary Guards in the Basij. And if we're going to go towards a dictatorship of the thugs, that is very frightening. It's very frightening for us, and it's very frightening for Israel. And then I don't know what Israel is going to do. And so I think at this point Israel is just waiting because we don't know which direction we're going. And I think we're at a crossroad. Well, we're both at a crossroads and out of time. Let me just underline the fact that I think one of the themes of the presentations is how much we don't know. And being in that situation, uh, policymakers are best advised to collect as much information as they can and not take any action right away. So let, let's hope that's followed. Please join me in thanking our speakers and thank you for all attending.